If you or anybody you know are struggling with depression or suicidal thoughts, please, 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 please do not be afraid to find safety in somebody else. There are hotlines, there are plenty of places for resources and out, outreach. I just know that when you are in that state of mind as a person who has been suicidal, as a person who has dealt with depression for a large portion of my life, um, the one thing that's hard to admit is at some point it becomes a choice. So if you're watching this video and if you are a person who is feeling low, um, just know that you're not alone and you can still choose life. It's not too late and it may be hard. It may be a struggle. It may take you a while to figure out just how to live. But you can always still choose life. So to be honest, I didn't actually think I would be recording this video. Not because I don't want to tell this story, but because I've had pretty elaborate thoughts and plans for how I want to tell this story. I am an artist and having a YouTube channel, I sometimes struggle with that, that sweet spot between sharing things you know, and creating content and actually taking the time to pour into the things that I want to share. And tonight I got to experience something called The Big Table and it's a conversation, um, a community conversation that levels the playing field in a lot of ways so that everybody can be heard, um, at least the way I experienced it. Um, and we were asked to share something that has changed or impacted our life. And the theme of the night was empathy and vulnerability. And after sitting and thinking about it, the, the one thing that I could think of was that surviving suicide has been the one thing that has really changed my life. And surviving suicide three times um, has really been the thing that's changed my life. And I want to tell this story, you know, I've tried to write songs about it. You know, I, I thought maybe that's how I should do it. I, you know, I want to write books. I want to write poetry. There's so many things. I want to turn it into short films and real films. And there's so many ways that I want to get it out. And I'm now realizing with each breath that I have time and I have I will have the opportunity to express my story, all aspects of my story, this story in as many ways as it's needed to be heard, but I have to be willing to at least get it out first. And so I, fig I figured why not start with my YouTube channel? Um, it's kind of why I made it. So I made this channel and I'm very thankful to everybody who has subscribed and who has supported me. But the fact that I've made this many videos, which I know probably isn't a lot compared to most YouTube channels, but it's a lot to me. <laughs> and having like just cried or told a sob story means there's, I've still not really been giving you all of myself because I am a crybaby, as you will soon learn. But let's get into this story. Let's get into this story. So the first time I survived suicide was when I was younger, was still in my adolescent years. And my childhood was interesting because I remember love. I remember feeling love. I remember knowing love. And I remember being love. I remember being joyful. I remember being very creative. And I also remember being very anxious, though just naturally. And now with a little hindsight, I recognize that my parents, when I came to them, were dealing with their own mental health and their own mental demons and battles. And I was birthed in that energy. Um, and I feel like in a lot of ways, I came 
to kind of disrupt the energy and to shift the energy and to bring in something new that was needed. Um, and so I feel like for most of my younger years, my mom was sad. And I think that's the best way I can put it. She was sad and so she did things that, you know, maybe wasn't always the nicest or the healthiest to, for herself or for me, you know. Um, but she was trying, you know, but she was sad. And I think I probably was the only one who saw it that way or noticed it that way. But that's just how I saw her. Um, I love my mom. So it's been beautiful watching her, you know, grow her journey. But I was, I feel like I was just in the energy of sadness. So whether I wanted to be or not, it was just there. And then I had my own relationship with my mom that was a little rocky when I was younger. And you know, I'll, I'll get into that stuff more, but I want to stick to this story. But, um, so I just already had kind of a recipe for me to be a little bit of a, a dark child. <laughs> um, and so I, I kind of used to, I, I, I felt like I was too sensitive. I was told I was too sensitive a lot. So I tried to teach myself how to not emote out loud or to not express it. And so usually I would sing, I would sing to myself a lot. Singing was my first therapy, um. It was my first way to like remember myself or to remember God or remember life or something like um but when I wasn't singing and I didn't know what to do with myself I would usually just suppress my feelings and so sometimes that would result in me trying to harm myself and I would like bite the inside of my lip or something shit stuff that probably seemed dramatic and in some ways could just seem like angry like an angry tantrum or I just would have these little balls of fire where I would just try to exert the energy. Sometimes when people would see it, sometimes people wouldn't. Like nobody would know but me. Some, 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 a lot of the stuff. So, but then I realized in that I, I realized in that time that I wasn't as committed as I thought I was, which is why even the first time I tried to you know, kill myself when I was younger. And I do that because I feel like looking back as a kid, there was a part of me that always wasn't really committed to it. That kind of was hoping that I didn't follow through with it, but I still tried. And so I always just acknowledge that I still tried, you know, whether it worked out or not, I still tried. And I actually used to joke about that to myself all the time because I was a pretty morbid little kid. Um, very Wednesday, I was like, <laughs> and... I would just joke about that, like, you didn't even succeed, you know? So I grew into, like, a, a angsty teenager, you know? I was pretty chill, but I was, I had an attitude, I had an attitude. I definitely had an attitude, but I was so just, I don't think people understood just how, if I didn't have the anger, I probably, that was what motivated me, you know? Like, and it wasn't even that I just walked around mad at people, I just, if somebody poked me or if somebody tried it, and it usually was authority figures. It wasn't even people my age. Like, I didn't try to, I didn't like conflict, but with adults, with authority, I was kind of just like, uh, you know, um, cause I, yeah, like I didn't, I was, I was cool. I was kind of cool with everybody. Like people didn't really have problems with me, but authority figures, oh, I would cuss the teacher out if they tried me. And just not even cussing, but just going back and forth and, like, having to have the last word and, like, you know, I'm about to disrespect because they would be disrespectful sometimes. My mom would understand sometimes, but she would be like, uh-uh. But, so by the time I get to college, I got all of that, you know, my dealing with childhood stuff, molestation, just all types of stuff I was, like, dealing with and processing my household that I was in. Like, I love my mom. I'm not going to tell her business in this video, maybe in other videos to come, but... That'd be down the line, but just the, I, it was just a lot of stuff I was dealing with. So by the time I get to college, I go to this private white institution and that was crazy because being a black girl in Ohio in a white, white college, it was just interesting. Like it was interesting. It was like, talk about identity crisis, but not even that I was trying to have one, but that it was just, I feel like the world was projecting identity crisis on me at that time. And I've always been very sensitive. Like, I was born very sensitive. Um, I'm just a very, just a, a sensitive to the energy around me and just aware. So, by the time I got to college, I kind of, that's when I had my, my first breakdown. And during the time that I was in college, I felt the least supported in my life. 
I wound up leaving school. I think that was the root of like why I left school, but I essentially while I was in school was being diagnosed as having bipolar disorder and I started to kind of just emotionally lose it. And I was I went to therapy for a little bit and they tried to put me on medication, but I was like, you know what? I don't think that's going to work for me. Um but before, all, in the midst of all of that happened, there was a part of me that was kind of aware, but there was a part of me that was just kind of out of it. And I did attempt suicide um, there. And that, I used pills that time, but for some reason it didn't work. And even some of the people at my school got involved. Um, the dean, like, stepped in and kind of, you know, because I'm, I'm a ball of light. Like, if people, people probably be even be surprised to, like, know that this is what be happening or going on in my life. Because I really do. When I'm, if, when I show up, I show up, you know. Um, um, but this is, you know, so regardless, they told me I needed to step away. But coincidentally, during this time, um, my aunt was dealing with breast cancer and her breast cancer was kind of progressing and she had, she fell. And when she fell, she cracked her spine and cracking her spine made her have to go to the hospital and relearn how to walk and, you know, just messed her up. But in that time, the cancer had time to spread. So when they sent her home, they sent her home in hospice. And so I decided to essentially, I was leaving school already. So I left school, you know, on a suicide attempt, ha wanting to be diagnosed as bipolar. And my thoughts, I was having a spiritual, now that I'm looking back, I was having a spiritual awakening. Now that I realized it, like I was being called and, and initiated into myself, <laughs> into my gifts, into who I'm supposed to be. Um, nonetheless, I'm moving with my aunt. And for like, I think it was like five to six months, I, I slept in the same room as her. Like I slept in a bed across from her bed from the moment she came home from the hospital and hospice until the moment they took her body out of the room. Um, and so during that process of taking care of her, it was very humbling. It was very humbling because I had to get over myself. Um, I had to put myself aside. I had to get over how I felt in order to think about what she needed in that moment. But also in order to connect with her because I had to really accept that she was dying and I had to accept that that time that I had with her was the time that I had with her so to make the most of it and to have to mature into that so quickly. And I was 20, so I was like 20. Um, and that was one of the most beautiful times of my life. That saved my life. So... That was my second time attempt to suicide, but then coupling that with my aunt and like being humble enough to take care of her saved my life. But from, I think from the moment she died until after that, I was in this phase of my life where it's like, I lost weight. Like I did, I did so much stuff to get my life back. Um, it's just, when you spent most of your life not wanting to be alive, you don't really just snap into knowing how to be alive and so I spent I spent a long time just trying to figure out how to I don't know just be in my body be okay with being in my body and I think that's kind of why, why my weight loss journey and transforming myself sparked it because I needed something to ground me into my physical self. I just needed to ground into my physical self. And so during this time, <clears throat> I started creating more and I really connected with a friend of mine that I had known since I was leaving middle school I want to say it was the first time I met him it was around middle school like <clears throat> like at least freshman year if anything because it was when I was out going and participating in poetry and 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 like coming into that like I was like 15 going to the open mics like sneaking into the adult ones with my homie like with my my little sister um well she's my sister um but I met a friend, I met a friend, like, and I met him performing poetry, um, 
And we just had a, our connection was just always very magnetic and just like we had known each other before, you know, like, you know, um, I won't get too into that in this video, but nonetheless, we started building together and during my connect connection um, and interaction with him, we started getting closer and he is the first person that I guess opened the door, put me in a position to combine my gifts and like my singing and my art with activism. And like I, he, he is, I wrote my first, I guess, intentional, like freedom song, intentional activist song, intentional song about what it means to like be a, you, you know, like the first person to remind me that I could not only was like God in my gifts, but that I could use those gifts to inspire, to heal and to encourage my, my people, our people. Um, and so working with him, you know, we had an interesting interaction, but at one point I realized in the interaction, I could just see, like I could see him. I always would see him as like my reflection in a lot of ways. And I know at one point something shifted and, I, I spent a year um, feeling, I spent a year expressing to people that I felt like he wasn't right, that I felt like, you know, and I, maybe I didn't do it the right way, you know, and now that I'm looking back, I feel like I should have probably prayed more than I even talked to people, um, And but that was, again, a lot of my stuff is always connected to some type of spiritual awakening or journey, but me and Sean were making music, we were we were really building some community stuff, like really building some stuff for our community, like building, like really building. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, I spent the year kind of knowing what I was seeing in his eyes, but not understanding how to, not knowing what to do. And so... Then one night I got a call that said that he had committed suicide. And so that is the third time that I survived suicide because knowing that I had that struggle within me and then being so close to a person like in a way that I can't really explain to anybody, but like I don't know, I felt like my aunt, like, her death and me attempting suicide around her death woke me up to life, and his suicide actually slapped me back into my body. All of that work that I had been trying to do to ground in my body, it's like his death made me realize that I had no choice but to be alive. Because to feel what it feels like to be, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know. I'm kind of, I don't want this video to be too long. And I think me getting emotional made me kind of not want to. <laughs> Nonetheless, my friend committed suicide. And that was the final call for me to to wake up and to stop being afraid to be alive and to stop being afraid of who I am and to stop swallowing myself and to stop. And I know it's loaded. I know it's loaded. That's what I'm saying. This is like a whole series of videos. I just felt moved to have this conversation and I would really like to know what you think. I feel like we don't have conversations about suicide and we don't have a lot of conversations about the state of mind that people are in when that happens. And it's not always just this sad, depressed. Sometimes people just feel too much in their bodies. People just feel too big in this world. And, like, not everybody is trying to go because, you know, like, there's tons of reasons. And so I just thought maybe me sharing this on my channel, especially after me kind of having a failed attempt at Vlogtober, <laughs> I just needed to share a piece of myself that was real, that was authentic, that was like not me trying to edit a video or trying to figure out, you know, like this is, 
I, I came on this platform to share my story, and this is a big part of my story. So in order for us to move forward in this relationship, I guess there was some point where I had to like, you know, let the cat out of the bag. But I survived suicide three times, and that shit changed my life forever, you know? And it's interesting because I had another friend recently within the past two years commit suicide, so that's two people that I've known to personally do it. And so I have to just say her, I have to mention her because that too like moves me. I just think by the time it happened with Sean, I kinda, I froze something. I don't think I went numb, but I think a part of me woke up in a way where it's like, even if I wanted to be sad, even if I wanted to like, I can't, that's not an option anymore. It's not an option. I can't go back. I can't go back. I have to always find the life and death. I have to always choose to be alive. I have to want to be alive. Like I have to allow myself to realize that it's not a bad thing to have to say that out loud because from the moment we're all born, that's what we're all going through. You know, like that's what's happening for all of us. But you know, like, drop a, drop a comment below how this video made you feel or do you have any experiences, if you know anybody, like, yeah, um, but thank you, <laughs> like, comment, subscribe, you know, whatever, don't, do, I'm gonna do me regardless. <laughs> thank you for letting me share my story with you. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo!